Hello, Keith Kaiser here with another lesson from God's Word. We're looking at our studies in the book of Acts, and so we're in Acts chapter 2 today. We're going to read at Acts 2, 42, 42, Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. And as we read there, you see it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And you say, well, who are the they? And the context is the people that believe the message that Peter was preaching here. The people that heard the gospel from the lips of the apostles as Peter and his fellow apostles were preaching and declaring the wonders of God, the wonderful works he had done through the Lord Jesus Christ. There were people that believed. 3,000 of them had believed and had demonstrated that by being baptized. In other words, they had taken their stand with the Lord Jesus. They now stood away from what they had formerly been. They had repented. They saw themselves as perverse, as twisted. Even though they were religious, even though they would have previously described themselves as pious, people that cared about God, maybe they'd even say they love God. And yet they realized that they were guilty. They were sinners before God. And they had disesteemed his son. They didn't value him. And many of them had cried out for his blood as he was sent off to the cross of Calvary. When the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came, in other words, they committed the outrageous crime of deicide. God manifest in the flesh was murdered at the behest of sinful, albeit religious and probably outwardly moral, human beings. Now, these people turn from that. They say, we, we don't agree with what we formerly thought. Before we neglected Christ, or we positively disapproved of Christ, we rejected him categorically. Now we do the opposite. Now we identify with him. Now we receive him. Now we say, come in and be my Lord and Savior. And I'm going to show the whole world that by being baptized. I'm going to say, not only was the cross a tragic mistake, in giving the Lord the worst sort of treatment imaginable, ill-treating our Maker. Nonetheless, we see it as the place where the Lord Jesus bore our sins in his own body on the tree, where he became the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so we identify with him and with that salvation. And now we can say, as Colossians 3 would later put it, our life is hidden with Christ in God. So now they wanted to live for the Lord Jesus, having repented, turned from their old life, and exercised faith in Christ. They believed in Christ. In other words, they put their trust, their full confidence in Christ to save them. Now these 3,000 were added, and it says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Now we might ask, what is the apostles' doctrine? Doctrine is a scary word to many people. They say, oh, don't tell us about doctrine. We want things that are practical. And yet there's nothing more practical in the world than doctrine. Doctrine is just a classical word for teaching. Doctrine means the apostles' teaching. And we have to ask, well, in what sense was it the apostles' teaching? Well, not in the sense that they originated it. They were not the inventors of this doctrine. They did not come up with the doctrines of the faith. They did not establish a creed for the church that we believe. And they said, in other words, you know, the Son of God came and he died to save us. Now we have to make up how Christians ought to live and what they should believe and how the church should function. No, you see through the Bible, God is a God who reveals himself. God is a God who teaches mankind. God is a God who hands down his truth. That's why when Paul would write to the Corinthians, both in chapter 11 and in chapter 15, he would reference the traditions that he had passed on to them. And he would explain that this wasn't tradition he learned from man. In Galatians 1, he would tell us, I neither received it from man nor was I taught it, but I received it by revelation. God gave it to him directly. And so this truth was handed down, and Paul accordingly handed it down or handed it over, we could say, to the church. Same thing with the other apostles. They were not originating the doctrine. They were passing on the doctrine that they had received from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, since they were chosen witnesses of the risen Christ, in that sense, this was their doctrine, the doctrine 
that he entrusted to their care to pass on to the church, as Jude would later call it, the faith once delivered unto the saints. Let's look at a cross-reference, a few of them actually, back in the gospel according to John. John 14, firstly. John 14. And uh, we go back to the Lord Jesus, and we remember this was just a few months before the night in which he was betrayed, and the Lord was about to go to the cross of Calvary on the next day. So uh, Pentecost is about 53 days after that. Uh, 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits, which corresponded with the Lord's resurrection. So 53 days prior uh, is, is when the crucifixion happened, and this is the night before that in John 14. And so we read here in verse 25, he says, These things I have spoken to you uh, while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So the Holy Spirit was coming to do a specific work. He was going to teach them, and he was going to bring to their remembrance the things that the Lord Jesus had said to them. Now, I've had unbelievers say to me, well, how do you know that everything is in the Bible that ought to be there? How do we know? What about the lost books? Or what about other things? Could Jesus not have said other things that aren't in this? Well, indeed, John ends in chapter 21 telling us that uh, the Lord Jesus, if everything that he did and said was written down, all the the world could not contain the books. You know, uh, between that and the interpretation of what he did and said, you would fill vast libraries with tomes about our Lord's life and work. And in fact, previous to that in John 20, he says, many other signs did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So John is quite explicit that this is a curated list or a curated group of stories. Not everything the Lord did is recorded. Not every sign or miracle is talked about. But what the Gospels do is they present specific stories about the Lord Jesus, what he did, who he was, Everything we need to know to be saved and to follow his example as the Holy Spirit applies that word to our heart. Now we go on to chapter 16 of John. <coughs> John chapter 16, please. John 16 and verse 5. But now I go the way to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Now he talks about the Holy Spirit's convicting work toward the world. But just a moment, let's jump ahead to verse 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, <clears throat> and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So very clearly the Holy Spirit toward the church is the spirit of truth. Just as the Lord Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So the spirit is the truth. And the spirit is going to bring to their minds what Jesus had said. And he's going to teach them even things that they hadn't learned from the Lord. Things that the Lord wanted to tell them, but they weren't yet spiritually prepared to receive it. But now on the ground of Christ's death and resurrection, the redemption that he caused there, the cleansing of these disciples and the coming of the Spirit who was now indwelling the apostles, now they could receive these truths. And so truth is progressive. It is God gradually unfolding himself to human beings and teaching us ongoing lessons, which through Acts we'll see the church grows in understanding the revelation. Now today we have the completed word of God. We have all that pertains to life and godliness, <coughs> pardon me, recorded in this book. And the Holy Spirit 
illumines us as we study the scriptures. He takes these scriptures and applies them to our minds and hearts and shows us the way we ought to live and the way we ought to glorify and serve God. But these early believers, going back to Acts 2.42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That was the teaching. In other words, there was a standard for their faith and practice. There was something that told them what to believe and what to do. And it was the doctrine that came from the risen Christ, given through his spirit to the apostles. That was what they were going to follow. Not Peter's opinions or his good ideas, not innovations that Thomas came up with, not Bartholomew's wonderful new insights or anyone else. It was going to be from Christ taking the Father's things, which were his things, and through the Spirit giving them to the apostles who gave them to these early believers. And they've been given to us because they were written down in the New Testament scriptures. And we know also by the many citations in the New Testament of the Old Testament that we could add the Old Testament to it. So both Testaments, Old and New Testament, the Hebrew Tanakh, as it's called by the Jews, and the New Testament scriptures of the Christians, they are one book, they are one revelation of God, they are the Apostles' doctrine. And these dear believers continued steadfastly in it. Now that's a mark of genuine faith. That's a sign of someone who's a true believer, that they want to know and obey God's word. You know, when you fall in love with somebody, uh, you don't mind uh, changing your lifestyle a bit. You don't mind saying, well, previous to this, my Friday nights have been my own. I could pretty much do whatever I want. Now I want to go see my beloved. I want to see my girlfriend or boyfriend, and depending on your gender. Uh, or I want to go see eventually when you're married, you want to do things with your husband or wife, if that's God's will for you to get married. And, you know, when we fall in love with someone, it's not a hardship or a chore to arrange our schedule around that person and even to maybe give up things we used to do and embrace new things and maybe hobbies we had that would take us away from our beloved and we say well i'd rather spend that time with my beloved or you know this kind of music really bothers my beloved i'm not going to listen to that around them I i'm happy to do it because i love this person you know and how much more when one comes to know christ we want to know what his mind and will are. We want to know what pleases him. We want to please God. We want to honor him. And the word of God is so wonderfully perfect because it tells us where we've come from. It tells us why we're here and it tells us where we're going. And it gives us a hope for the future, not wishful thinking, not merely optimism, but hope in the sense of it tells us the future before it has occurred and tells us that our future is secure in the Lord Jesus Christ. It gives us encouragement. It gives us wisdom. If any man lack wisdom, who give, uh, who, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and upbraids not, James chapter 1 says. So we can ask God for wisdom. In the Lord Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, Colossians 2 says. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs says. And Psalm 111 has the same idea. And we, we can go to him with our questions. We can go to him when we doubt. We can go to him when we have fear. And the Lord speaks to us through his word. Because he's already foreseen everything we need. And as our great high priest in heaven... He's able to succor us. He's able to give us aid through the scriptures to comfort us from them. The things that happened aforetime were written for our learning that through the scriptures we might have comfort and patience of hope. Uh, Romans 15 verse 4 is going to tell us. So no wonder they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They said, if the Lord Jesus died for me, if he suffered the death of the cross, can there be anything he wants me to do that I wouldn't want to do? I want to know him more and more. I want to please him. I want to live for him. He died for me. I'll live for him. He not only died, but he rose again. And now I want to walk with the risen Christ spiritually. As I look into his word, I want the spirit of God to show me the Lord Jesus Christ. We're like those Greeks that John 12 talks about. They said, sirs, we would see Jesus. We say, yes, Lord, show me more of yourself in the word. Like Psalm 17 tells us, we want to behold 
wondrous things out of thy law. We want to see thee. And uh, what a wonderful thing it is to commune with the Lord through his word. And how pleasing to God when we're not just hearers of the word, as James 1 cautions us, but we're doers of the word. When we're obedient to this holy scripture, to the apostles' doctrine. That is the doctrine of God given to his son through the Holy Spirit, passed on to the apostles who wrote it down for us. So may we continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine as well, because we're continuing in the word of God when we do that. God used men to write it, but it's the word of God. It's inspired of God. God breathed, in other words. It's his revelation, his mind revealed to mankind. So may we follow it and adhere to it for his glory. Thank you for listening.